uh, we are very happy that uh, Dr. Anuradha uh, Kanni Ganti, so uh, she has joined us and uh, uh, she is uh, going to discuss on uh, the topic travels through translation. And let me uh, inform you all that uh, she has been a multidimensional and multidisciplinary person uh, in all her approaches. She is affiliated to uh, 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 Inalco, Paris, France, and she works in the Department of South Asia, uh, Himalaya Department, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, in Inalco. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I personally know her for a very long time. I, uh, I met her uh, uh, at the University of Hyderabad when she uh, greeted me uh, uh, saying bonjour, I guess, uh, in, in French. And uh, it was very unexpected uh, uh, in the university campus where English and Hindi are the first languages for anyone. So I was very surprised, though I could follow the first word, I knew that uh, this meant uh, uh, good morning or uh, hello, uh, but then it was a surprise and I noticed that uh, she would do that with everyone, probably with a research intention more than greeting, <laughs> to know how people react with that. But then yes, uh, uh, that's how uh, our in interactions opened and I noticed that she is a very, very multidisciplinary person in her approaches. If you uh, uh, notice the kind of work she has done, she has uh, worked uh, on uh, uh, different, uh, very diverse uh, uh, themes, including uh, Kuchipuri uh, dance, a paper on Kuchipuri dance, then working on language rights, then linguistic inequalities, and then multilingualism. And uh, I, as I was informed by somebody else uh, commonly known between us that she also has some training in statistics and uh, she uh, was interested in identifying the role languages play in uh, the development of economy itself. Uh, so uh, connecting language with economy, these are like very diverse uh, uh, areas, of course, very compatible and connected, but very diverse areas showing how uh, how well one can uh, handle very uh, different uh, uh, specializations. So uh, I am very happy that she has taken out time for our program and joined us today to deliver this uh, special talk where she'll be discussing uh, uh, topics of interest to uh, translators as well as interpreters. And uh, she would be also focusing on things like uh, management research and uh, uh, idea of transposition. These are the things that we discussed over phone. And uh, I also look forward to uh, hearing her directly and know from her uh, how she would like to present these themes for an audience which uh, is a mix of uh, a fine mix of uh, practicing as well as theoretical translators. So without uh, too much of formal uh, introductions, I request uh, Dr. Anuradha to uh, begin her uh, talk. Thank you really very much, uh, Tariq, for your very kind um, introduction. I'll uh, just take uh, additional um, five seconds to say actually that my doctorate is in uh, statistics. Uh, I have a master's in industrial engineering, and I spent a few years working in mathematical finance, actually, before uh, jumping off uh, that ship and then uh, swimming across to um, anthropology and um, humanities, so which I, I think I always wanted to do. So I got that opportunity in Paris and was able to uh, study under some of the most uh, brilliant people. And uh, when I was uh, in this Paris Institute, Derrida was uh, lecturing downstairs and Pierre Bourdieu was still alive. So I really was very, very lucky. Okay, so since we have limited time and I would actually like to engage in a conversation if possible at the end, with our um, with our uh, participants today i'll uh, quickly start um, so thank you very much to the national translation mission for uh, opening this opportunity to me and specifically to professor uh, lakshmi haribandi who uh, proposed my name um, to give this special lecture after a kind of long conversation we had about mutual interests in translation so okay i think i'll start so I titled my talk, Travel Through Translation of an Accidental Translator. As I will show now, I'm neither, um, I'm neither, no, okay, I will say, I'm neither a translation professional, nor uh, do I actually study uh, translation. 
in any way, uh, but I do have a translation activity and I'll talk a little bit about that later. So I consider myself uh, to be actually a, an example of a translation as itself a habitus because I'm perpetually in a mode of translation. Um, Tariq already said that I've been moving between disciplines, so there is that aspect of quote unquote transposing, translating, hybridizing all kinds of ideas. Uh, and my training in mathematics actually helps me uh, to do this because it's a rigor that you get in, um, in reasoning, right? And observation and looking for patterns. So uh, yes, and I've moved uh, across three continents and uh, lived in many countries. So I'll move forward quickly. And I have, to, so in spite of, I'm not a professional in the translation field, as I just said. Uh, but I've confronted translation as a process, as an element of uh, very different uh, processes and phenomena. So that is what I wish to expose to you. Uh, so please do not expect uh, a very structured, formatted presentation with a pedagogy involved in it. I'm not going to be teaching any concepts today. I'm really going to open up some um, areas of uh, discussion, basically. And please uh, feel free to write your comments uh, and uh, save any questions if there is any time at the very end. I'll really try to go fast, OK? All right. So some translation encounters in the last 20 years or so, uh, where I have been in, uh, let us say, in these types of fields. Uh, I, uh, I was speaking with Professor Lakshmi about my love for the Russian translations. And uh, we talked about how that opens up a whole new field, could open up potentially a field of inquiry. To look at that period of Indian um, history, that we had a very close relationship with the Russian, um, with the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union had a cultural diplomacy involving uh, their, tra their translation, where they would send people to India to learn Indian languages, and people would go to Russia, uh, Soviet Union, to run Russian, and perhaps even other languages like Ukrainian, etc. So this is a wonderful topic, which I'm very interested in. Uh, another snapshot, um, we talk about outsource outsourcing a lot, where India is used as a cheap labor uh, market for all kinds of uh, processes in globalization. I don't know if you've ever heard of outsourcing even in translation. So there are people in France who actually make a profit by uh, sending uh, French, uh, French uh, to French or from French translations to Pondicherry. And they, they actually exploit those uh, people there and pay them very little. And um, so I just wanted to mention that there is also outsourcing in low cost translation that's going on. Um, and uh, then I just wish to mention that um, we should have a little bit of skepticism also. Uh, I have uh, attended many conferences on uh, I, information communication technologies in UNESCO, for example. And uh, we need to have a little bit of skepticism about the utopia of machine translation. So I just want to put that out. Let's have a slightly critical view. Not all languages are end up, end up, uh, will end up uh, having a machine translation. Uh, no, that's not really going to happen. Perhaps we have to wait 100 years for that because there's we are in the real world, right? Okay, and um, then I wanted to also mention in my travels through different disciplines, I have encountered quite new subjects of inquiry. A very recent one is called language in international business. And this is a whole new field of research where translation in multinationals uh, is a very interesting topic of uh, inquiry. Okay, I can send you some articles if you're if you're interested. I'm a part of a working group on that in France. Okay, and and then of course language and sustainable development goals. And what uh, role does uh, does language and in particular translation processes uh, can uh, can, uh, can what role can they play in developmental processes where language barriers have. Uh, actually a very big impact in the developmental processes. So you should also think of that. The translation as a, as a, as a mode of acting, action against uh, language barriers in development, okay? And then I also wanted to show these two snapshots of uh, what I call desperately seeking translation. It's a, there's a movie, a Hollywood movie called Desperately Seeking Susan, and I kind of took that expression. So I, I, I have done some uh, surveys, uh, uh, informal surveys of different industries and uh, 
how uh, these language barriers get addressed in our Indian industries, especially in the informal sector. It's a very big issue. So there's a story that I want, very small story I want to tell you about a micro industry in Tirupati, uh, about which I, I carried out a small thing. And um, they, they function usually in a, in a typical informal, uh, informal industrial setting. Uh, they, they just function by explaining our different technical things as they come in whatever language uh, they can find. And uh, this has not really been studied, okay? But there's a lot of translation going on uh, because technical concepts even today remain in English and somehow uh, the manager or the foreman or whoever it is is managing the workforce has to do uh, all kinds of translation activities, uh, totally uh, ad hoc, uh, uh, ad hoc types of translation in order to communicate instructions and so on. Okay, so that's a very interesting process. And I have met people who are desperate to find uh, some type of uh, guidance, uh, some type of uh, materials uh, which would help them in their field or to actually uh, communicate uh, technical information to their workers, uh, processes, etc. So that's a very interesting situation. And um, today, the translate business translation is, of course, picking up. But many years ago, I was uh, recruited by a shipping company in Visakhapatnam to urgently give a translation of uh, some business documents. And they were literally willing to pay anything I asked. So it was that desperate. So that's just to tell you, there's absolutely a huge market out there uh, for translation services, um, and I hope it develops. Okay, so these are just some snapshots in my own uh, uh, trajectory. All right, so here I kind of put a lot of stuff, uh, but I'll summarize what I have written, some personal reflections. I have gone through the website of the National Translation Mission, and I was really happy uh, about the whole um, fabulous, wonderful um, kind of uh, mission that has been taken on uh, to uh, develop uh, uh, knowledge materials in Indian languages. And Maya, I want to um, transmit to you my understanding of uh, how that came about, because for a very long time, nothing was going on in India, Re literally almost nothing. Um, so. We have always seen translation in a literary sense as a civilizational force, uh, you know, from Sanskrit to you know our Indian language, um, Indian bhashas, uh, and then circulation of texts, uh, but mostly in a cultural way. We never really thought of translation as a useful, uh, useful activity. Of course, we know in history that they were. Uh, you know, Dubash, uh, Dubashis, and uh, they were helping in, the, you know, the, the Mughal courts, etc. And with the British and the other Europeans who came in, there were Dubashis who were helping them. Uh, of course, that's uh, interpretation, obviously. And there were also translations going on in these courts. Uh, very interesting, um, very, very interesting things uh, were happening, but we never really had translation as a profession. To serve practical purposes and practical needs. Um, so for me, the when you look at the the phases in uh, post uh, post independence India, uh, for many many decades, if you look uh, at what happened even to the question of language policy, uh, and uh, the larger questions uh, of development and economy, uh, there was really almost very little going on. Um, there were language policies were mostly uh, oriented to, of course, uh, assuring uh, you know citizenship you know, the, the rights of the citizen uh, uh, of representation. There was that aspect. Uh, so there was this aspect of democracy and nation building in language policies. And of course, there was some development in education, uh, especially school education and media. Uh, but in many, many other, even in governance, in the law and so on, there was really a neglect. Uh, interestingly, if you look at um, the post-war uh, period um, and language, uh, the importance given to language. A uh, lot of thinking was kind of, I paraphrase uh, Gunnar Mirdal, who was a Nobel Prize winning economist and who was advising a lot of countries. Uh, he, I'm paraphrasing, he, you know, he uh, wrote a, a classic called uh, Asian, uh, Asian drama, um, The Poverty of Nations, where he uh, actually gives a lot of chapters to language, languages of uh, Asia. And he says, oh, these are old languages and they only serve for telling epics and stories and uh, things like that. So I think we have come a very long way. 
uh, since then and especially the government has invested uh, a lot of resources and uh, has done a lot so we have we have become ready to benefit from uh, opportunities of today but for a very long time there wasn't uh, much going on uh, and i for me i've always seen indian bhashas as, uh, as service or feeder languages that is you would get educated in the indian language and then uh, you'd uh, switch to english you know you're not going to do much the the, the bhasha that you learned in school you you go off and uh, switch to english uh, if you want a, a job in the formal sector right so for me i i was kind of viewing them as feeder languages uh, to uh, to the english uh, kind of the english section of the economy now if you look at the the kind of the timeliness of this ntm um, ntm mission the ntm pro program i think i see it as an intersection of many things coming together and the time of, time was ripe and then so it happened okay whereas nothing much had been happening uh, for a very long time so this is external factors which are a whole bunch of uh, global um, and uh, macro level uh, frameworks uh, that emerged in the last uh, few decades so there was obviously globalization it's a big thing there's a information and communication revolution information and knowledge society as a, as a, as a paradigm uh, there's also the sustainable development goals so these are all macro global macro international frameworks and then we have the internal uh, logic which was the post liberalization india and uh, industrial uh, ambitions of uh, india so all of a sudden you require a man uh, a manpower you require a workforce uh, which is capable of uh, filling those uh, those production uh, roles and these people need to be trained and these people need to have a proper literature and proper manuals proper materials to to be trained right so so all of a sudden you have a need okay uh, which is a very pragmatic practical need and those are um, so the resources and everything move towards that so I, I just wish to say that it doesn't come about by accident that we now have this focus, okay? So I would say after a very long benign neglect, uh, viewing translation only in cultural terms, now we have come to actually giving it the dimension that it should have had for a, a very long time as a key factor in uh, socioeconomic development and economic growth, okay? So translation will be a driver in um, this uh, this build up uh, henceforth uh, hopefully so and then also don't forget there has been a conceptual shift uh, in the view of language now as a skill and a resource okay so this is also a very important shift in um, taking us to this pragmatic use of uh, translation and giving it a very strategic importance okay um, all right so i'll quickly uh, Time. Yeah. So I'll quickly um, tell you a little bit about my own activity as a, as a translator. Actually, because I've been in a position of being multilingual uh, in a situation where Telugu is a very rare language in uh, Europe, right? Just like Tariq was saying, French is a relatively rare language in India. Telugu is a rare language in Europe. So my skills have a premium from that point of view. So I have uh, been doing different types of translation. I'm not going to spend time on that. It's just to show you that I've also actually been a translator and, and I continue to be one. Uh, I could tell lots of stories about that, but that will be for another day. For example, in literary translation, I, I was collaborating with a French uh, colleague and we started to have differences, uh, some differences, interesting differences. Uh, in how we uh, approach translation so very interesting uh, things to say on that as well okay yes i'm going to talk a little bit more about my volunteer translation work in a, in a moment uh, just want to make a comment also on multilingualism and translation uh, there are different kinds of multilingualisms actually there is not one multilingualism when you start making policy so this is just a small comment in uh, you have the capital multilingualism of the important languages right and the important languages uh, out of which translation translation flows out you know they are the source languages right and um, then you have the small ones which are the small multilingualism the out of which are uh, usually the target languages they receive translation 
So there's a lot of these types of questions uh, that we could examine. Um, there's um, European Union. I have a remark to Professor Lakshmi a few days ago. European Union spends an enormous amount of money on translation. Uh, because they have uh, something like, uh, let us say, I think they have something like 24 languages or some official languages, and they're obliged to translate between every single one of them. I mean, translate uh, all documents into every single one of them. So that is, of course, vertical translation, not uh, horizontal. Uh, so there's uh, lots of interesting things to say on that as well, on the politics uh, and the kind of the hierarchies and the struggles uh, related to that. So I also now want to spend a few minutes telling you about a personal project that I've had, and this is 20 years, actually. It, uh, I was working on it when 9-11 happened. I was actually in the office writing up a project, my project when it happened. OK, that's uh, something I remember. So I wanted to be a knowledge uh, uh, translator long before uh, NTM was established and uh, also produce technical literature for Indian languages, OK? Because until the skill development establishment, um, you know, now which is taking care of these things uh, to some extent, uh, I feel that what they're doing is, is really great, but I would say it is 10% of what needs to be done, right? So there was just, was just a subaltern type of production of, uh, you know, how to repair uh, how to repair, I don't know what, you know, a machine, a sewing machine. There are all kinds of these types of books were getting published. And um, these were all actually, to large extent, translations of something else. Okay, so those deserve to be studied. Those, what you could call subaltern productions of uh, technical uh, material for skills, for what we call in, um, in Telugu, vritti, vritti, which is the occupation. Okay, so that was something I've been very interested in, and uh, it's not easy to do that. So I wasn't able to go very further. In particular, I wanted to really uh, do a, a marvelous uh, French publication called What Do I Know? There's like hundreds and hundreds of titles, and they each treat one topic of interest. Uh, they're not cultural topics. They're all, for the most part, very, very practical part, uh, things, things like history of sewing machine. If you want to know about sewing machines, there will be one on that, okay? So there's this marvelous uh, small books. They're very small, 40 pages or so. They're written by a specialist and um, written by a specialist and it resumes the latest knowledge on that topic in very, very limpid language. And they were sold for very, very modest amounts of money. So I wanted to bring this model to India. Well, it didn't work out for whatever reason. I just want to say one thing about the skill development, uh, literature, and the translation aspect coming into that. I, I have actually been following uh, following it because it's very. I am very interested in this problem uh, because partly because of my business uh, background, perhaps, uh, but uh, and technical and scientific background. So um, when you look at the translations, you know they have tenders for skill development materials. They are produced in English, right? I think with some collaboration with Germany, I, I believe. Uh, the, the English version is likely uh, very good and uh, does its job really well. And then they put out tenders for translation of these uh, English versions uh, into Indian languages. and. Um, they get produced like there's now, I, I believe, probably hundreds of them. And um, not all of them get translated, but I've always wondered about the process of selection, the tender, who answers the process of selection, how they get selected. Is there some, I don't know. Because I've actually, I work with, uh, with an ITI in rural Visakhapatnam, where there's a uh, very famous NGO there, and they run an ITI. And so I've been following up this question at the ITI and uh, looking at the Telugu translations of the skill development materials. And um, the director of the ITI, who's himself a very good engineer, uh, was perfectly good in English, perfectly good in Telugu, uh, told me that those manuals actually don't correspond to the ground reality of how things actually work in different parts of India. So this is a very interesting problem. Because you have these manuals being produced by a committee of people in Delhi who are obviously very good in what they do, uh, but there is uh, it's a top-down uh, thing, and it's not uh, sufficient in my view to just put a tender for a translation 
uh, and then uh, just get it translated and then release the translation. The, so what these people do on the ground is they have to redo uh, these translations in a way that uh, the students can appropriate uh, the, the technical information, the processes, and so on. So there, there is a backup work uh, that has to be done after the translation is released. Okay, So this is, once again, a snapshot of a situation which uh, is worth looking at. It's not sufficient just to just to get things translated, uh, you know, in some way or the other. Um, you absolutely need a follow-up, and uh, and uh, you absolutely need to do that if you really want those translated materials to have the effect that they should be having. Okay, the learning effect, uh, so that people can appropriate them and use them. And I want to tell you another uh, point in this. I've also looked at the construction industry and the materials they produce. And uh, there's also obviously translation in that also, but they don't actually give the, the, the technical manuals or to, the, to the workers or to the trainees. Only the teacher has it. So the teacher is once again translating from this technical manual. The teacher is translating to the worker, but when the worker, uh, when the trainee leaves, they don't have anything in the hand. Okay, so you see, well, it's a larger problem, but uh, I just wanted to mention that. Now, I think I really need to hurry. So I want to go to a totally different dimension and look at translation as a social good. Um, as you probably know, translation and interpretation uh, is now seen in many contexts as a human right. Okay, especially, obviously, in the courts, uh, because it's absolutely essential that uh, if you don't speak, uh, you know, if you speak another language, uh, you have a right to be represented and uh, to tell your to tell your stories. So there is an absolute need for translator interpretation. Huh? I'm talking about, sorry, I'm con confounding both, but okay, there's also translation, there's also interpretation. Okay, so in legal context. Um, in Europe, especially migration, asylum seekers, refugees, etc., very big issue of interpretation. Uh, disasters and health emergencies. Uh, uh, there was a very famous case of Ebola in Africa where translation uh, played an enormous role. Uh, I would inv invite you to read the case study of that and uh, read about uh, the role played by translation in actually actually screwing up the situation initially, and then it had to be corrected. It was a very, very good case study. So the value frameworks that uh, are evoked here is the value of linguistic diversity, very important now in the West, OK? And linguistic rights. Uh, there's a, a lot of uh, work on linguistic rights. I don't think we have that in India. I'm not sure we have that. So translation and interpretation provision is related to these values. Uh, and then um, language, of course, is a key barrier uh, to uh, information uh, and raising awareness in even in uh, aid activities, right? If you want to, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, do medical, um, medical work, uh, educational work, whatever, all kinds of, uh, you know, help people build houses, whatever it is, you want to help them to do there's translation processes involved in fact in africa there's a huge issue with, uh, with the fact that the the doctors get trained in uh, in european capitals or they in any case they get trained in a european language they are incapable of communicating medical information to their patients okay so this is uh, very interesting and think about the similar situation in india i'm sure we have the same situations like go to a tribal area or uh, you know, a remote area and um, the com medical communication is a, I'm sure it involves uh, that type of problems. Now, when you come to all these uh, right to translations, etc., once again, it's not a utopia because there will be always a choice. There are hierarchies in languages, there are asymmetries in provision, especially in for pairs of languages, you will not find anybody who's trained to, to actually, uh, you may likely not find anybody who's uh, who's trained to translate or who can translate, who has the skill to translate. So, so there's a big issue. And of course, it's very expensive to actually uh, uh, provide uh, translation services. It's expensive, right? So it's an issue. Even though it's a right, it's seen as a right, it doesn't mean everybody gets to uh, benefit from the right. 
Okay. Um, it was a very interesting case of uh, Afghanistan where, um, very interestingly, the Dari and Pashto language received enormous number of funds. Okay. So lots and lots of people were able to get trained in translation and you, you've been following the news. So, you know, they've talked a lot about the translators and how they were getting left behind, etc. So that's an exceptional case, but that's because it was a huge military budget, right? Huge, huge military budget. So it was just a part of that, um, that they would train translators. Okay. Now, I want to really focus now on translation and interpretation as a voluntary activity and a social service. That's something we should be aware of in India. And we can all uh, participate in this and help out. Uh, potentially, if you have language skills and, uh, and are willing to do that. I myself was a part of a voluntary translation and interpretation uh, organization, which I think now in recent years has become rather inactive. But the idea is to intervene for free uh, where people cannot afford translation. Okay, that was the idea. And I actually uh, worked with them in uh, the social fora, which probably many of you don't know about, but in the early 2000s, they, they, there were these anti-globalization uh, uh, movements. And one of, uh, there was a very big one in uh, Mumbai in uh, 2003. And I came from Paris with a team of translators and interpreters to help uh, voluntarily. Uh, so I want to tell you just in two minutes, a very interesting story about that. Uh, <clears throat> the Europeans had no clue about how language processes work in India. So they were transposing their ideology of linguistic rights, translation rights uh, to the Indian scene, but uh, it didn't work. Uh, there's a very interesting story there and I actually wrote it up and if anybody wants, um, so it was a big fiasco. So, okay. So, but anyway, I really wanted to mention this aspect of translation and interpretation as something we can do as a service, okay, to help out in many situations where there's a desperate need because of language barriers. There are so many language barriers, even internal to language. If you go to a remote uh, Telangana village, uh, they may not understand uh, what we say in Hyderabad at all, a normal conversation about some medical issue or something, they, we may have to quote unquote translate even from uh, standard to the dialect, right? Okay, so that's something we can think about as something we can contribute, okay, socially. Uh, now I want to switch to uh, this other field where, which I mentioned earlier, application of uh, the concept of translation as defined in business studies, okay? So I mentioned technology transfer, transposition, translation. I have written a paper which is in revision now. I worked, um, worked with uh, someone in Paris on um, technology transfer in the water technologies. So there is a concept of translation and I'll give you the definition now. It's not, obviously it's a different, totally different use of the concept of translation, but it's something we can recognize. Uh, and then there is theorization about translation in management field. So these are two references. Okay, now the definition of translation in, um, in um, so technology transfer studies, for example, is that you have an object or an artifact which is coming from one culture of one context and it's being taken to another context. How does this object or artifact or procedure or process or even idea, concepts, everything which gets transposed to another country, how does uh, it get uh, understood, appropriated, and used at the end of the day. So this is where there is a concept of translation. And as you can see the definition here, to simplify it, uh, like in management, for example, translation has in, been evoked in relation to introducing a managerial practice in a society which is not really receptive to it. So it has to be translated and adapted and explained and somehow adapted to that culture. Okay, so this is a very interesting notion of translation uh, in these fields, and I worked on that. Okay, so now we have, uh, yeah, we still have some time. Now, uh, Tariq had mentioned uh, that I was interested in cinema for a while, um, and um, I came up with this very, very ambitious uh, framework, uh, which finally I did not develop, but I wanted to tell you about it if anybody is interested. Um, so there is a concept in linguistics called linguistic area, okay, uh, which any uh, linguists here uh, would know about. 
India is a linguistic area, for example. So I trans I transposed, quote unquote, that idea to the area of cinema and was looking at different dynamics, especially the translation processes. So the circulation of cinema in South India between all these languages in the different forms of uh, forms of circulation. One of very big important one is dubbing, which is in other words, it's a translation, right? So dubbing is just audiovisual translation. Uh, and of course, with the voice element, huh? don't uh, I'm not forgetting the voice element, obviously. But there is a linguistic part, which is uh, translation of dialogues, right? And the storytelling when it's uh, so I uh, came up with this idea that the translation processes and other kinds of linguistic processes. Um, OK, that's you can um, ask me more if you wish on that. And so there also there is translation which could constitute eventually uh, just like you can think even of a literary area. South India is a literary area after centuries and centuries of these types of uh, literatures in contact translation processes, adaptation, all kinds of things, re, re, you know, re-adaptations, retellings, all of these are like uh, translations, twice removed, thrice removed, multiple times. So these processes could eventually uh, be said to have constituted a literary area in South India, but nobody has defined that. So I was trying to define a cinematic area or cinema area okay that's a prospective project which i haven't really uh, followed up uh, really i just presented it somewhere but i didn't okay now i want again jump to another uh, thing another another insight or another object of study i call it savage translation it's actually an uh, an accepted field of study now called non professional translation there's a lot of it in Africa. So uh, there are international conferences on non-professional translation, but I call, and I was doing some work uh, on Telugu texts, I call it also savage translation. Um, the South African uh, academic I was in touch with, she liked very much this word savage translation. So what do I mean by that? What I'm saying is today, uh, unknown to us maybe, many of us, there's an enormous massive amount of translation going on. Everything we read in the media, everything we read, uh, a lot of stuff we read online, a lot of stuff we read uh, even in print, this has gone through some type of translation process, especially where it depends on what is being written about. This is what this is the work I did actually. Depending on what is being written about, there will definitely be translation. If it's just a purely local uh, story, Obviously, there is no need, but anything beyond the local level, there will be some level of translation. And these translations, I found, are unregulated, what we can call unregulated translation. As, at least when I started studying um, these, uh, this, this, uh, these texts. Okay, But I think now there has been a lot of progress. I mean, I had done this more than 15 years ago. But now there has been a lot of progress in training, at least to some extent, uh, people who do these uh, very, very rapid uh, daily instant translations, I suppose, and maybe machine translations helping with that as well. But it's still done, in my view, and I could be corrected on this in a largely unregulated way. But what do I mean by unregulated translation? That is, it's not subject to the type of controls and discipline and rigor that you would find in a literary translation. In a literary translation, we do a kind of gatekeeping. The translator is responsible uh, for a lot of elements, including style, vocabulary, um, and uh, quality, right? A lot of things which make for quality and has to be very careful to produce a work of quality which will be accepted by the readership and by the liter literary establishment as a work in that language. It has to be acceptable. So that means it has to correspond to the norms, literary norms of that language. And has so there will be a very careful process and it takes a lot of time to do a literary translation. It's slow, it is reflect, a lot of reflection, there's a lot of rework, etc. But when you look at media translations, which we read every single day, they have to be done absolutely fast. There's a, a big volume of uh, material which has to be translated. I actually don't know who does it. It would be very interesting to go and see where is this army of people who are 
translating all the time this content which is coming from outside right so this is in itself an object of study and my claim here i have not uh, perhaps i should only say it's a claim it is a shaper of language today this massive volume of translation which is unregulated which is going on every single day all day long which is giving us all this content which we don't know where it comes from and who is doing the translation and we don't know if they are trained or anything but um, when you actually study these newspaper and a lot of people have studied them I'm, i know uh, i also uh, in the phd thesis i started i was looking at a lot of texts okay i'll tell you about that as a last point so the um, the distortion of the target language is very important when you do this type of unregulated translation the person is actually not very good in the language not very good they probably paid almost nothing to do it right they are not trained um so the end product is what you read the prose that you read if you really analyze the prose uh, of all this uh, translated uh, materials that uh, we casually read and then throw away right uh, whether it's on a website or a news uh, news uh, print uh, print media um you will see that it's not very good language quite often okay it's not the 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 sentence structures the 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 words uh, the translated words there's a lot of careless uh, elements in it which is what i personally observed and i cataloged all those uh, types of uh, irregularities and a kind of uh, and i've even seen critiques uh, of um, there used to be actually there used to be in telugu um, print uh, magazines there used to be they used to make fun of what were called translation magazines anuvada patrikalu okay because it's uh, they you would look down upon something which is an anuvada patrika because everything is taken from somewhere and not written uh, originally uh, as a text it's just uh, taken from somewhere converted probably without any permit or any payment of any kind and just uh, uh, then the content is produced in telugu and then sold okay so this is anuvada patrika and uh, patrikalu uh, and there you will see that the language uh, is really uh, quite uh, something so once again we are saying that uh, this is a very massive uh, phenomenon and has uh, i feel a very 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 significant impact on how the language is getting shaped today and how young people use it lots of english words coming in and etc you know all those things already uh, and also the 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 the, the, uh, the quality of writing etc all of those things okay so it's worth looking at uh all right so now i'll finish and hopefully we'll have a 5 minutes or so if you have any questions or comments i would be really really happy uh, to have them so i want to tell you about uh, the book project i'm uh, developing now it was supposed to be my second uh, phd in paris and um, the reason i abandoned it also is related to translation i when i started this thesis in france they had extremely uh, uh, strict rules about only writing in french you had to write it in french now they have relaxed it and you can write the uh, thesis in english okay but the the formal writing in french for someone who is not trained in france is actually very difficult okay it's so i would think in english start writing in french and it would look very strange because i was translating from english into french it would look very strange and i would not dare to show it to my professor so ultimately i was so frustrated that i left it right so that is just a funny aspect of why i abandoned uh, this uh, but now i wish to convert this work into a book so here is the two the different aspects where translation comes in and my basic object of study was Uh, the emergence of technical prose in telugu that was one side of the story so uh, there's obviously a lot of translation processes involved in this uh, emergence of technical prose uh, and um, so that's the first uh, research uh, topic and i use uh, sheldon pollock's idea of uh, concept of vernacularization this is a process by which you have transfers from a uh, high language to a low language quote and quote huh? the, i mean this high and low is uh, obviously a a way to think about it uh, but uh, so 
from Sanskrit to vernacular, for example, in, in Europe from Latin to French, Latin, you know, to German, it's not uh, Latin to English, etc. So this is the type of the high-low uh, thing. And also we can call, uh, he was using the concept of vernacularization. And I think we are in that same process of vernacularization of uh, what National uh, Translation Mission is doing is a vernacularization of content and uh, knowledge, which is in a European language, uh, and it's being transferred into Indian languages. Um, but this transfer is not just linguistic. It's on multiple levels. Uh, it's very complex, because at the same time, um, the translation, uh, unless it's being done by machine, there are human beings involved. There are skills involved. Uh, and then there is, of course, the reception side of it. You also have to study the reception. So how are these texts being received and used and appropriated, etc.? So there's, a, it's a very big process. So it's not just linguistic. Uh, so I tried to make a framework for the for this uh, transfer process. And uh, my uh, kind of uh, hypothesis, or rather a working hypothesis, is that there is, uh, if you look at uh, our vernacular, is in vernacularization process in the literary arena or in the devotional poetry etc devotional literature which happened over many many centuries uh, um, in our bhashas um, i call it a process where you take the initial text you translate it or you adapt it and then over a long period of time because now the literature is getting developed slowly you, you abandon this idea of taking from another language and you start making your own. That's what I was calling autonomy. So my um, kind of working hypothesis is uh, to see where we are in this process. Uh, if you look at our technical prose in Telugu or in any other language, of course, you'd have to define what technical prose is. Uh, starts with a translation, and then slowly uh, maybe uh, local writers start taking a little bit of material from these translated works and start writing their own by adapting. So it's, we can call it an adaptation. So they are producing semi-original texts. And finally, we move to a phase of original production. I don't think we are there yet. Okay, We are not there yet because uh, there's other things that come into the picture. And my second, uh, now I'll really finish in the next two minutes and we'll have five minutes. So my second uh, part of the work um, is what happens with uh, language in the workplace, in the Indian workplace. Of course, when you say Indian workplace, it's huge. It's absolutely enormous. Uh, most of the Indian workplaces are informal, uh, as you know. Uh, most Indians work in informal sector, uh, not in offices, right? But I started with office. I started with the uh, office situation and look at uh, uh, I looked at a particular French uh, company. I'm not going to name the company, uh, but I worked with this French company a little bit because I forgot to tell you that I also do intercultural work uh, with French companies uh, which come to India and have to work with Indians and have to understand the Indian system, etc. So, so they actually came into this company. It's a, it's a really nice story. I want to tell you in only one minute. They came into this company and... Um, uh, looked at the different strata of workers. If you look at the strata of workers, workforce, in a typical, let us say, white collar, or rather a white collar company or some type of technology company, you'd still have a white collar part, you'd have the, the blue collar part, and you'd really have the very, very unskilled labor on the bottom. At all these levels, you will have translations going on. Okay. Um, so when this uh, all some type of translation will be going on in workplace communication, anything which is technical, right? So this French company came in and saw that the people at the lowest level of uh, the workforce uh, were seen as replaceable, would not ever get any type of training or, or transmission of any anything beyond uh, telling them do this, do that. So the French company, because of French values, uh, uh, took seriously their responsibility towards all employees and hired uh, someone in the company who knew enough Telugu to translate materials into some type of understandable, simple Telugu that even the lowest unskilled labor could follow. 
Okay, so this is something I found marvelous. I found it very exemplary and uh, I then did a survey of other Indian owned companies and found that they in general have a very callous attitude uh, because they just want to save money and uh, can't bother to, to educate their workforce or give them any type of uh, yeah, any type, to, any type of uh, pedagogy in uh, learning something, acquiring some skills, etc., and see them as replaceable for costism. So I'm going to stop here. I hope I did not dump too much on you. Uh, please take the next five minutes if you have any uh, comments or questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.